Hi, Griffin. Are you subbing for Rogue today? Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to Rogue's Reads. This is Griffin, because Rogue is taking a nap in the kitchen, actually. And here's Daisy Ray's taking a nap up here. Daisy Ray. Yeah, she don't want to talk to me. Anyways, hi guys. I'm Renee. I'm the children's librarian at Salem Public Library in Salem, Ohio. And this is our virtual book club for kids in uh, fourth to eighth grade. And we are currently reading The Genius Files by Dan Gutman. Uh, so big thanks to Dan Gutman and this is me, Harper and Collins Publishing for allowing us to share this book this way. Uh, as you see, we are almost to the end of this one. Coke and Pepsi have been, they're on a cross country trip. Finally made it to Washington, D.C. Their aunt is getting married tomorrow. Remember, they haven't seen their aunt in 10 years because their mom and their aunt got in a big fight because their mom did not like the aunt's boyfriend. But 10 years have passed and it's all going to be okay now, right? You know, wed weddings are good. Weddings are happy. First, before we get to the wedding, Coke and Pep have gotten a series of ciphers that have led them to the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, Smithsonian, they are at the, I don't want to say it the wrong way, so let me, uh, American, Museum of American History, at the, which is one of the Smithsonian Museums. So they're supposed to be there at two o'clock, and they've got four or five different monuments that they're I was supposed to visit or something so it's kind of maybe like a scavenger hunt I don't know so they're at the museum we're gonna find out what happens to him today so this is chapter 20 day at the museum the twins walked through the metal detector looking all around for anything suspicious the security guard peered into coke's backpack for a moment looked at coke rolled her eyes and waved him through she had seen people try to bring drugs, alcohol, explosives, and even live animals into the museum. Now, this kid had a can of silly string, a roll of duct tape, and little bars of soap. Nothing surprised her anymore. There was no other line, no tickets to be picked up, no admission. The Museum of American History, like all the Smithsonian museums, is free. Coke and Pep rushed inside. Coke and Pep checked the clock on her cell phone. It was 1.46 in 14 minutes. Something was going to happen. For, the question was, what? I hope Bones and Maya show up, Coke said. They'll be here, Pep assured him. They promised to have our backs. Look, Coke shouted, pointing straight ahead. On the opposite side of the museum, nearly filling the wall, was a sculpture made of hundreds of shiny silver panels arranged in the shape of a wat, waving flag. And below it were these words. The Star Spangled Banner, the flag that inspired the national anthem. This way, Coke said, marching toward it. The entrance to the Star Spangled Banner room was below the silver sculpture on the right. The twins went through the doorway, not knowing what might be around the corner. When we think of the Star Spangled Banner, we think of the song, Oh, say can you see? But the Star Spangled Banner is a banner. It's the flag of the United States. Coke and Pep walked hesitantly into a darkened hallway with paintings on the wall and plaques describing how Francis Scott Key, on a boat a few miles from Baltimore Harbor, watched by the dawn's early light. The British bombarding Baltimore's Fort McHenry on September 13, 1814. The attack lasted 25 hours and explosions illuminated the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. So you guys exposed to my singing. A huge American flag, which inspired Key to write the lyrics to his famous song. The twins turned the corner into an even darker room. Aside from a dim line of guide lights on the floor, the only thing they could see in the room was the flag, the real one, the star spangled banner that had inspired Francis Scott Key. It was kept in near darkness to prevent it from fading. Wow, Cook whispered, this is the real deal was the largest flag either of them had ever seen, 30 by 34 feet. And eight more feet of the right side was missing because souvenir hunters had cut off pieces over the years. One of the 15 stars had been snipped out too. And now the flag was under glass, laid out on a tilted floor 
with the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner on the wall behind it in white glowing letters. Do you think somebody's supposed to meet us in here? Pep asked. I can't see anybody. I can barely see my hand in front of my face, Coke replied. Let's get out of here, Pep said. It's scary. But Coke did see one other thing in the dark room, a piece of paper on the floor in front of the display case. He stooped down to pick it up. The twins rushed out the opposite side of the dark room so they could read it. Oh, that's another one of those ciphers, which I think they've already figured, they've already done this one. Greensboro lunch counter, Pep shouted. They dashed out of the Star Spangled Banner exhibit and looked to the right. Down the hall was a sculpture of George Washington wrapped in a cloth and holding one hand up in the air. They looked down the hall to the left to see a picture of a lunch counter. A lunch counter! This way, Cook said, and they ran over there. It was a pretty ordinary looking lunch counter with two pink and two green stools, but history was made at that lunch counter. It was at a Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. Back in 1960, only white people were allowed to eat in the store. But on February 1st of that year, four black college students sat down and asked to be served. When they were told to leave, they refused. They came back the next day, too, with more students from the university. Word got around, and soon black students in 54 cities were holding sit-ins at segregated lunch counters all over the country. After media attention, and within six months, Woolworths and other stores had opened their lunch counters to anyone who wanted to eat there. It would be another four years until the Civil Rights Act was passed, ending segregation in public accommodations and employment. The twins looked all over for a clue telling them what they were supposed to do or who they were supposed to see at the lunch counter. A few tourists with cameras were milling around, but they seemed harmless. Nothing really captured the twins' attention until Coke spotted another note. This one was taped to the bottom of the glass in front of the lunch counter. He peeled it off and read... Oh... There's part of one of their ciphers. John Bull, Peppy on the train. They ran over to a little booth nearby with a short gray haired lady sitting next to me. A sign next to the booth said, ask me. Where's John Bull? Pep said, asked breathlessly. Downstairs, the lady said, pointing. When you get to the lower level, look to the right. You can't miss it. Thanks, Pep said, already on the run. What's your rush? The lady said. My goodness, that old train has been sitting there for years. It's not like it's about to leave the station. The twins thanked her and ran down the stairs, and sure enough, when they got to the bottom and looked to the right, a big old-time train was sitting there, its smokestack almost touching the ceiling. John Bull was one of the first steam locomotives in America. The plaque in front of it said the train was imported from England in 1831 and used to move freight and passengers between New York and Philadelphia. Back in those days, it took two days to make that trip by horse and buggy. John Bull reduced it to five hours, which was considered amazing at that time. But Coke and Pep weren't interested in the history of rail travel in America. They were interested in who had sent them all those ciphers and what was going to happen at two o'clock, which was now just five minutes away. They searched all over the John Bull until Coke noticed another piece of paper. This one was on the tip of the big iron cowcatcher on the front of the train. He picked it off and Pat peered over his shoulder as he looked at it. Another cipher. Down with a flying elephant, Pat yelled first. Directly behind the John Bull on the wall was a directory of the museum's three floors. The twins searched frantically for the word Dumbo, but it wasn't there. But the directory showed a little icon on the third floor. That must be Dumbo, Pep yelled. Follow me, Coke said. There was an escalator right behind the John Bull. The twins dashed up it, taking two steps at a time. They went as high as the escalator would go. At the top, they looked all around until Pep spotted a three west sign on the other side of the museum. They ran over there, and the first thing they saw at the end of the hallway was Dumbo. It was part of a kiddie ride, a shiny gray fiberglass elephant car with room for two small children to fit inside, to sit inside. Dumbo wore a purple hat and a white ruffled collar around his neck. The plaque in front of it said the ride had been inspired by the 1941 animated film Dumbo and began operating at Disneyland soon after the park opened in 1955. Riders could make it fly up or down by moving a bar in front of them. 
Now what, Cook asked, looking around desperately. It was 1.58. Time was running out. There was a low glass wall surrounding Dumbo to prevent visitors from climbing on it. The twins couldn't examine Dumbo, but at the back of the bottom of the glass wall, Pep found another note. Follow Dumbo's trunk. Is it a cipher, Coke asked? No, Pep replied, we're just supposed to follow the trunk, hurry. Dumbo's trunk was pointing at a slight angle to the left. There was a small gallery about 25 paces away titled Treasures of Popular Culture. Coke and Pep ran over there and the first thing they saw in that gallery inside a glass display case was this. It's Dorothy's slippers, Pep exclaimed, the real ones. The twins pressed their noses against the glass to get a better look at the sequined shoes. The plaque explained that Judy Garland, who was just 16 at the time, wore these sequined shoes, size five, in the movie The Wizard of Oz. In the original story by Frank L. Frank Baum, Dorothy's slippers were silver. Did you know that? I did. They were changed to ruby red for the movie so they would show up better against the yellow brick road. Well, that's all of them, Pep said, throwing up her hands. That's all the clues. It's two o'clock, Cook said. Nothing happened. Nobody's here. After all that, maybe we made a mistake somewhere? Do you think it was all a big hoax? Pep asked. Maybe they were just playing with our heads the whole time. Nothing was going to happen on July 3rd at 2 o'clock. Maybe Maya was right, said Coke. Maybe it's going to happen on July 4th. Both of the twins were, they were relieved in a way. Neither of them particularly wanted to confront the unknown. Hey, look, there's current the... Pep said, turning around to look at the rest of the exhibit. And at that moment, five guys dressed head to toe in black SWAT uniforms came running out of nowhere. And I'm going to stop right there for today because I think that's a, a really fun place to stop. Um, I think we've just got two or three chapters left. Yeah. I think that's a great place for us to pick up tomorrow. SWAT. I mean, we're talking like these are serious, serious law enforcement guys. When you get when you get SWAT after you, you're in trouble. Um, Coke and Pep haven't done anything though. Not, I mean, they haven't done anything illegal. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, this definitely looks like bad news for them. Um, but you're gonna have to wait until tomorrow to find out, unless you have a copy and you just read ahead. Uh, <laughs> I say as much as I love books, I have to admit sometimes I would, I do that too. Uh, if not, if you just want to wait till tomorrow and I'll read it to you. Uh, so I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a wonderful afternoon and hopefully we get to see you guys all soon. Thanks. Bye.